You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In 1884, a New York City cigar maker named Louis Zeiger was on a picket line outside a cigar factory. He and his fellow workers were on strike against their employer for low wages and terrible working conditions. As he walked the line, Zeiger spoke with men who seemed ready to cross the picket line, urging them not to become strikebreakers. Soon, policemen arrived, called in by the factory owner. They ordered the picketers to disperse. When Louis Zeiger said they would not leave, citing the peaceful and legal nature of their demonstration, a patrolman stepped up, smashed Zeiger's head with his billy club, and dragged him off to jail. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 91, in which we dive into the history behind the Labor Day holiday. We are coming to you this week from the Sam Gompers Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Keeping us in marching formation is our tireless executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, it's Labor Day weekend and the semester is off and running. So it seems like a good idea to return to the Gilded Age, my favorite period in American history, to explore the origins of Labor Day. There's a lot more to it than you might think. So let's get to it. All that's left for me to say is, please check out all the amazing merchandise at inthepastlane.com. You'll find In the Past Lane t-shirts, hoodies, long sleeve shirts, plus mugs, stickers, and more. You'll also find these t-shirts and mugs and such with history-related quotes from notable people, like the following. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. That's one by Abraham Lincoln. And our top seller, Historians Against History Repeating Itself, which comes in many variations, including History Majors Against History Repeating Itself, and History Teachers and History Lovers, and so on. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on Merchandise. Thanks. And please subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tell your friends about it. And give us a shout out on social media. Maybe tell people how much you enjoyed this particular episode. Thanks. Okay, people. Make a nice marching line. It's time for a parade. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Back in the late 19th century, Labor Day meant something more than a three-day weekend and the unofficial end of summer. This unique holiday was first celebrated on September 5, 1882. On that day, thousands of workers in New York City risked getting fired for taking an unauthorized day off to participate in an event that celebrated unions and workers' rights. This first commemoration of Labor Day testified to labor's rising power and unity in the Gilded Age, as well as its sense that both were necessary to withstand the growing power of business and industry. Labor Day originated with an organization called the Central Labor Union, a local labor federation, essentially a union of unions, formed in New York City in January of 1882. Almost immediately, the CLU became a formidable force in New York, staging protest rallies, lobbying state legislators, and organizing strikes and boycotts. By August 1882, membership in the organization boomed to 56 unions representing 80,000 workers. But the workers involved in this organization wanted to do more than simply increase membership and win strikes. They wanted to build worker solidarity in the face of jarring changes being wrought by the Industrial Revolution in the Gilded Age. That's the period in American history covering roughly the last third of the 19th century. During this period, the United States was transformed from what we'd call a developing nation in 1865 to the world's leading economic power by 1900. 
the favorite word of politicians and business leaders in this era was progress. But along with this tremendous increase in national wealth came a problem, widespread poverty. Evidence of this troubling duality could be found everywhere, but especially in New York City, where the mansions of big business tycoons like Vanderbilt, Morgan, Carnegie, and the rest arose along Fifth Avenue, while in the rest of the city, two-thirds of the population lived in cramped and squalid tenements. In short, the establishment of Labor Day signaled that Gilded Age America faced a crisis of growing inequality. The motivation to establish Labor Day also came from a rising sense of alarm among American workers over the growing power of employers over their employees, and frustration over the unwillingness of political leaders to do anything about it. Employers enjoyed a free hand when it came to increasing hours, slashing wages, and firing workers at will. Practices that rendered workers powerless and pushed more and more of them into poverty. These developments, noted labor leaders, called into question the future of the American Republic. As the Central Labor Union put it in its constitution, economic servitude degrades political liberties to a farce. Men who are bound to follow the dictates of factory lords that they may earn a livelihood are not free. As the power of combined and centralized capital increases, the political liberties of the toiling masses become more and more illusory. In other words, Workers in the Gilded Age began to argue that in this new world of industry, one that was so very different from the agrarian world of the founders, mere political equality, meaning one man, one vote, was no longer adequate to maintain a healthy Republican society. Modern industrial life, with huge corporations, global markets, and increasing numbers of people working for wages, required a recognition that Republican citizenship included an economic dimension, not just a political one. As the reformer and labor activist Henry George wrote in 1879, Quote, in our time creep on the insidious forces that, producing inequality, destroy liberty. The fact that all male citizens possessed the right to vote and equality before the law, George argued, no longer guaranteed them the blessings of Republican citizenship. If one was forced to work 60 or even 80 hours a week, and yet they didn't earn a living wage, his right to vote was meaningless. He had sunken into what workers in that era called industrial slavery. Extreme inequality, in other words would destroy American democracy. So these were the concerns that in 1882 prompted labor activists affiliated with New York's Central Labor Union to establish Labor Day as a day that would celebrate workers and inspire them to reclaim their dissipating rights. As John Swinton, editor of the city's only labor newspaper, wrote, whatever enlarges labor's sense of its power hastens the day of its emancipation. Now, we should pause here to note that the precise identity of the Central Labor Union leader who in May 1882 first proposed the idea of establishing Labor Day, this remains a mystery. Some accounts say it was a man named Peter P.J. McGuire who proposed the idea. McGuire was General Secretary of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners and a future founder of the AFL. But other people argue that it was another man with a similar last name, machinist Matthew McGuire. Well, the truth is we'll probably never know the answer to which McGuire deserves the title of Father of Labor Day. But it is clear that both men played a key role in promoting and organizing the original holiday in 1882. And so it was that after months of preparation, the chosen day, Tuesday, September 5th, 1882, finally arrived. Optimism among the organizers ran high, but no one really knew how many workers would turn out. Very few workers could expect their employers to grant them the day off, and quite honestly, many of them feared getting fired or blacklisted for union activity. When William G. McCabe the parade's first grand marshal and a popular member of the International Typographers Union arrived about an hour before the parade's start, the situation looked grim. Only a few dozen workers stood milling about City Hall Park in lower Manhattan. But, to the relief of McCabe and other organizers, by the time the parade touched off at 10 a.m., about 400 men and a brass band had showed up. In the early going, this small group of marchers faced ridicule from bystanders and interruptions in the line of march because policemen just refused to stop traffic at the intersections. But as the parade continued north up Broadway, it swelled in size as union after union fell into line from side streets. Soon the jeers turned into cheers, as this spectacle of labor solidarity grew more and more impressive. As they walked, marchers held aloft signs that spoke both to their pride as workers and the fear that they were losing political power and economic standing in the republic. Some of the signs read, To the workers should belong all wealth. Labor built this republic, labor shall rule it. Less work and more pay. Eight hours for a legal day's work. And all men are created equal. Midway through the parade, 
the throng of workers, now numbering about 5,000, passed a reviewing stand at Union Square. Among the many dignitaries present was Terence Powderly, Grandmaster Workman of the Knights of Labor, the most powerful labor organization in the nation. The parade then continued up Fifth Avenue, past the opulent mansions of the new super-rich of the era, the Vanderbilts, Morgans, Carnegies, and more, before ending at 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. From there, the participants headed to a large park on Manhattan's Upper West Side for a massive picnic. By late afternoon, some 25,000 workers and their families jammed the park to participate in the festivities, which consisted of live music, stirring speeches on workers' rights, and consumption of copious amounts of food and beer. Thrilled by the success of this first effort, Central Labor Union leaders staged a second Labor Day the following year in 1883, and the event drew an even larger number of participants. The next year, in 1884, the CLU officially designated the first Monday in September as the annual Labor Day, calling upon workers to, quote, leave your benches, leave your shops, join in the parade and attend the picnic. A day spent with us is not lost. Nearly 20,000 people marched that year, including a contingent of African-American workers. The next year, 1885, saw the first contingent of women workers march. With such an impressive start, the tradition of an annual Labor Day holiday quickly gained popularity across the country. By 1886, Labor Day had become a national event. Some 20,000 workers marched in Manhattan and another 10,000 in Brooklyn, while 25,000 turned out in Chicago, 15,000 in Boston, 5,000 in Buffalo, and 4,000 in Washington, D.C. Politicians took notice. And in 1887, five states, including New York, passed laws making Labor Day a state holiday. Seven years later, just a dozen years after the first celebration in New York, President Grover Cleveland signed into law a measure establishing Labor Day as a holiday for all federal workers. Labor Day caught on so quickly among Gilded Age workers, because unlike the traditional forms of labor activism like striking and picketing, or civic holidays commemorating victories in war, Labor Day drew workers together for the purposes of celebration. As P.J. McGuire later wrote of the parade, No festival of martial glory of warriors renowned is this. No pageant pomp of warlike conquest attend this day. It is dedicated to peace, civilization, and the triumphs of industry. It is a demonstration of fraternity and the harbinger of a better age, a more chivalrous time, when labor shall be best honored and well rewarded. In the 20th century, Labor Day parades grew into massive spectacles of pride and power. These events reflected the growing power and influence of organized labor in American society. Increasingly, the labor movement and social reformers pushed for policies aimed at limiting the power of big corporations and the wealthy while protecting and enhancing the opportunity for the average citizen to live a decent life. These policies included the eight-hour day, increased workplace safety, collective bargaining rights, expanded public education, unemployment insurance, and social security. Their success reflected a growing acceptance of the idea that for Republican citizenship to be real, it had to include a baseline of material well-being. By the 1930s, President Franklin D. Roosevelt enshrined freedom from want as one of the nation's essential four freedoms. True individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence, said FDR. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. Roosevelt's New Deal and subsequent movements of reform like Lyndon B. Johnson's War on Poverty boosted the well-being of the average American. So, too, did the influence of a strong labor movement. Labor's power was on full display on Labor Day in 1961, when 200,000 workers marched up New York's Fifth Avenue behind Grand Marshal Mayor Robert Wagner, and passing on the reviewing stand, dignitaries that included Governor Nelson Rockefeller, Senator Jacob Javits, and former President Harry S. Truman. The result of these reforms, and strong unions, was a steady decline of extreme wealth inequality. Whereas in 1890, the top 1% of Americans owned 51% of all wealth, by 1979, the share of wealth owned by the 1% had dropped to 20.5%. But since 1980, the trend has shifted dramatically back towards increased wealth and income inequality. This trend has many sources, including deindustrialization, cuts to social programs, and the deregulation of Wall Street. But a key one has been the decline of the power of organized labor. In 1955, union membership in the United States hit its all-time high, with 39% of American workers belonging to unions. Today, union membership hovers around 10%. And wealth inequality? In 1979, as we just noted, the share of wealth possessed by the 1% had fallen to about 20%. Today, it's closing in on 
and it keeps on rising. This trend explains why so many Americans have taken to calling this era the Second Gilded Age. So this weekend, as millions of people celebrate Labor Day by not laboring, Americans would do well to reflect on the core claims of the early labor movement that invented Labor Day. Gilded Age workers and those who followed them argued that the nation's democratic values and Republican institutions were threatened by economic policies that left a small number of people extremely wealthy and powerful, while the great majority of citizens struggled to obtain or hold on to a piece of the American dream. Today, this concern animates calls for a $15 minimum wage, single-payer health care, tougher regulations on corporations, banks, and Wall Street, and greater investment in infrastructure and public education. So Labor Day should remind us that while, to paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, all are created equal, they also grow up to live in a society shaped by policies and laws that determine whether opportunities for success are focused on the great majority of citizens or merely the 1%. Happy Labor Day, people. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, any message you want to convey to our listeners? Run while there's still time. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. <laughs>